Good morning. This is the morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on April 7th. And um, we're going to hear a presentation from our colleagues at the Justice Center of the Council of State Governments. But before we go there, thank you, thank you all very much for joining us. I just wanted to finish one piece of business here in the room before we turn this over to you, um, it, which is, folks, it, it, the Senate is, so when the budget bill left this body, we had that outstanding piece of the question around Deemers and the settlement of that. I, maybe I've already said this, but the Senate is looking at putting that in the budget as well as the Pay Act. I have said those two things already. Okay, so I will cross them off my list. But we just need to be following, and I don't want you to be surprised when it comes back with those. So with that, um, let us turn, as I said to our colleagues at the um, Council on State Governments, they have been working for a number of years now with us on justice reinvestment um, related issues. Um, and uh, we are joined by David D'Amora, Madeline Dar Dardow. I'm sorry, you will correct us when I turn the helm over to you. And Angela Gunter. Um, we have What's about what 45 minutes or an hour? Whatever. You said 45. 45 minutes um, for this presentation. I personally am really looking forward to it, having totally enjoyed and been interested in this work for some period of time. Representative Squirrel. No, I just wanted to introduce Monica Weaver to oh. from uh, DOC. Great. Hi, Monica. Thank you for joining us. I don't have my glasses on, so I can't, or I do now, and I see you. Um, so thank you also for joining us. Um, we are, some of our colleagues are here virtually, and some are in person. And um, so without any further ado, let me turn this over to you. Um, maybe we'll try to listen to your presentation if they're kind of natural stopping points. Maybe pause and um, if, if we can see if there are any questions. And the last thing I wanted to mention is, is that we're also joined by Representative Kurt Taylor from the, um, the House Institutions and Corrections Committee. And Rep uh, Taylor, thank you very much for joining us, and you're certainly welcome to ask questions and participate fully. Um, and I understand that we also have, um, I don't know what Matt D'Agostino's title is anymore. I think he's deputy still Deputy Commissioner. Commissioner. Yeah, from DOC is also listening in. So with that, let me turn this over to you, Mr. D'Amora. Thank you, Chair. I'll actually jump in here. Um, my name is Madeline Dardo. You were very, very close. Um, I'm a senior policy analyst here at the Council of State Governments, and we're really, we appreciate the invitation to join you all today. I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh, I'm not able to share my screen. So we are an anti-screen sharing committee. Oh, okay. We have your, uh, uh, a printout of your slide deck. And if you could just guide us through it, that we would appreciate that. It's hard, I, if, if we're screen sharing, then I can't see everybody on the screen and I'd like to be able to call on them. So sorry for that inconvenience. That's not a problem at all. Um, having done lots of these virtual meetings at this point, I totally understand wanting to be able to see folks and not just kind of have it take, taken up by a presentation. Um, so our, our plan for today is to give you all kind of a somewhat um, quick overview of Justice Reinvestment 2 and then really focus specifically in on the working group's recommendations related to reinvestment and upfront investment funding to support the ongoing implementation of Justice Reinvestment. So I'm gonna be hitting um, some high notes on what was really a, just a massive undertaking by um, folks in Vermont over the past two and a half years. So if you are interested in some additional detail, please don't hesitate to stop me as I'm going um, and to kind of expand on something further. 
Um, we've also provided you all with the working group's final report, which also includes a lot of details. And that was what they submitted to the legislature um, earlier this year in January. So as I mentioned before, um, we are, and I'll go ahead and if you wanna go to that second slide, um, so we are um, the Council State Governments Justice Center. For those of you that are not as familiar with us, we're a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We work with all three branches of government and we are really focused on using policy and research to um, increase public safety and strengthen communities. You can go to that next slide. And as, um, as the chair mentioned, we have been here in Vermont from 2019 through the end of 2021 as part of the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, which is funded through the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Pew Charitable Trusts. And so over the past 15 years, the Justice Center has helped actually 33 states, including Vermont, in using a justice reinvestment approach to avert prison growth, improve data collection and analysis, and adopt evidence-based practices that reduce recidivism. Next slide. And so Justice Reinvestment II, just as a quick reminder, began in Vermont in 2019 after representatives from all three branches of government requested support from and were approved to use a justice reinvestment approach by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And so after that approval, um, Governor Scott convened the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group, which identified several key areas of focus for the initiative. Um, and those included analyzing crime trends, um, to understanding how supervision revocations were impacting overall incarceration numbers, assessing behavioral health related challenges for the justice involved population, and then identifying ways that the state can improve data tracking and analytics to inform ongoing decision making and policy making. You can go to the next slide. You should see a graph here. And so during the working group's policy development process, our Justice Center team was able to do extensive data analysis across crime, court, and corrections data sets. And one of the primary findings of this analysis was that from 2017 to 2019, almost 80% of sentenced DOC admissions were people returned or revoked from community supervision. Um, and so, and of that 80%, over 50% were returns from furlough. And so looking at the chart that you have, um, you see returns from parole, probation, and furlough in different shades of blue, with furlough returns being that largest area at the bottom in dark blue. And then next slide. Our team yeah. also- I'm sorry, could we just pause there for a moment? And um, I should be able to do this, but will you remind us of of what furlough is in Vermont. I, I just, because I think it's significant, this issue of furlough violations. And if people understand what it means to be on furlough, it, you, you appreciate this number even more, I think. Sure, that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, so furlough is kind of a, at least for us, um, furlough is a unique status when we came to Vermont where a person um, is released into the community under supervision, but is still under um, the purview of the Department of Corrections. So they're still considered um, underneath the Department of Corrections um, in, 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 as, an, as an inmate, basically. Thank and you, Monica, Andy. please. Monica, looks like Monica wants to jump in there. Yeah. Hi, Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weaver. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add to Madeline's description of furlough, um, which is you know defined in statute as a legal status, is that furlough is really considered an extension of um, the uh, inc incarcerative facility walls, right? So it is um, considered an incarcerative status. And therefore, it's solely under the, the purview of the Department of Corrections. The distinction between um, these parole, probation, and furlough, it's, um, I can summarize it like this. Parole violations would be under the purview of the parole board. Probation violations would be under the purview of the judiciary. And furlough violations under the purview of the Department of Corrections. Thank you. I, th I think those are important distinctions to remember and understanding solutions here. It is, and it's also very uh, difficult for people to understand because, as Madeline mentioned, it's a, it's Vermont 
is uh, complex in that way. Yeah. Although we're getting cleaner here. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Great, thank you, Monica. And so if you go to the next slide that has a line chart on it. Um, so during, um, so our team also found that should Vermont's incarcerated population continue to increase at the status quo rate, that it would result in a projected cost of 43 million in out-of-state Fed contracts by fiscal year 2025. Obviously, I'm sure what's in all of y'all's minds right now is that it's important to note that this analysis took place in 2019 prior to the onset of COVID-19. So the incarcerated population in Vermont and nearly every other state um, looks very different right now um, after the past couple of years. And we're gonna talk about um, a little more in a minute about you know, what that looks like and what that means. However, I did want to show you this slide primarily to illustrate that one of the main goals of Justice Reinvestment II was to decrease the overall incarcerated population in order to reduce that spending on out-of-state contract beds. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. We're doing first names. Jim? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the slide that has the out-of-state contract beds on the bottom and it shows it increasing, but in fiscal year 24, it goes down by almost 100. Is that a typo or is that, am I reading something? Oh, you caught us on a typo, apologies. So you can see the, the funding increasing. And so that actually should have been a, um, so that number, the 235 is a typo, apologies for that. And I can get y'all the correct number there. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good to know we read these slides. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. We work hard on them. It's good yes. to know people are paying attention. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide, you'll see here that um, you know following you know several months of this intensive data analysis, lots of discussion and stakeholder engagement, um, the working group developed um, a package of policy reforms focused on these four goals. And so those are reducing recidivism and revocations to prison achieving a more equitable system across gender, race, and geography, improving data and reporting to inform decision-making, and then reinvesting in policy implementation and sustained progress. And the next slide shows that these recommendations became what is now Act 148, Vermont's Justice Reinvestment II legislation, which was enacted in July of 2020. And so there are really kind of three primary policy changes in Act 148, which you see here as one through three. And that's the establishment of presumptive parole and that to reduce the reliance on the, fur on the furlough legal status um, that Monica talked about earlier, to streamline that furlough system to make it less complex, to increase community supervision and consistency, and then to increase earn good time from five to seven days per month um, to incentivize good behavior for people that are on prison and on furlough. And then there were three areas where the bill required different groups of stakeholders to do some additional work and then report back to the legislature, which is what you see in four through six. And so that includes um, some additional data collection and reporting from the Department of Corrections around the use of graduated sanctions. Um, the Agency of Human Services was also directed to look at gaps and how people with behavioral health needs, mental health and substance use needs in the criminal justice system are identified and served. Um, particularly across shared clients within the departments within um, the Agency of Human Services. And then there was additional analysis required related to demographics and sentencing um, and to better understand racial disparities, but also to just generally assess gaps in um, areas of study that the legislature tasked the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group, um, which uh, oh, that, um, excuse me, sorry. So there were, so assess, I had a, something pop up and snag my attention, I apologize, folks, um, to really look at race and ethnicity gaps in data collection analysis, which I know you all are particularly engaged in right now around the Office of Racial Justice Statistics and building Vermont's data analysis capacity in that area. Um, in addition to this list that you see here, there was actually a whole other list um, of areas of study that the legislature tasked the Justice Reinvestment to Working Group, um, but we're going to talk about those in, in a little bit later on. Do folks have any questions? I just want to pause real quick before we um, start going into um, some other some uh, other data for you. Will you just take a moment to 
talk about why we are thinking that we need to dig deeper into the racial disparities issue and understanding that data in, in terms of the consequence in DOC, as well, obviously, as people being incarcerated, but what that means. Absolutely. So back in 2019, when our phase one team was doing the initial data analysis in Vermont, um, what they found was when they just looked at um, proportions, um, particularly for Black people um, across community supervision and incarceration types, um, what they found was disproportionality. So that um, Black people were more likely to be represented um, in incarcerative settings and on community supervision just kind of across the board. And um, what they didn't have time to do and what they didn't weren't able to dig as deeply is into that kind of why, what's driving this. And so that's kind of where you saw this uh, particular um, piece of Act 148 is to say, hey, let's go a little bit deeper. And there's kind of two parts to that, right? So the part is, can we go a little bit deeper with the data that we have, right? But then there's also a lot of recognition that there's data that there's not access to. Um, and so, um, or that the data just doesn't exist. And so that's where um, I think, you know, both there's kind of two prongs that happened post Act 148. Um, our team was actually able to obtain some court data to understand how people, you know, what's what's happening before people end up on super, or supervision or particularly what happens before they end up incarcerated. And we were able to complete a racial equity and sentencing analysis, which I can share um, the report that was shared with the state with you all um, to be able to better understand some of those um, you know, some of what's happening kind of prior to incarceration, obviously recognizing there's a lot that is happening more upstream, right? Um, and then kind of parallel to that, but very much connected, um, the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel has been doing some really extensive work, and I was actually going to talk about this in just a minute, um, to be able to understand data gaps, right? And we highlight some of those in our, in, um, our equity analysis, but they really took a very, very deep dive in understanding, you know, what's the additional information at each kind of point in the criminal justice system that you all need to have a more complete picture of what's a really complex, nuanced, but very, very important issue. Um, and so what you see here at number six is really just kind of the start of what became a much broader process. Um, does, that, does that help with your questions, Sharon? Yes, thank you very much. Wonderful. Madeline, so, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I add one other point quickly? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, David DeMora, Senior Advisor with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Good morning, everybody. I just want to make one other point regarding the racial equity study. Uh, despite the fact that there are some data gaps, uh, we were able to show that the uh, argument that's often been made when we've spoken to folks in Vermont, which is that it's the out-of-towners, the out-of-staters that are causing this to happen, who are coming from other places, uh, the data does not support that, quite bluntly. <clears throat> it is uh, not the folks who are coming from other states that are bringing drugs into Vermont that are accounting for the disparity in the arrests and in incarceration in Vermont. And, and it, I think that's very important because uh, many of the folks that we've spoken to have uh, used that as sort of the rationale of why the problem exists and, and uh, really the data simply does not support that. So I just wanted to highlight that, Madeline. Thank you, that's a very important, uh, there, that is a perception I think across the board. Uh, and it's a, it's a very important point, thank you. Definitely, thank you. And so before we move into the data, I do want to take a minute and hopefully not brush over too quickly um, what was actually months of hard work by people in the state to implement these policy changes and do these additional tasks. So um, following the passage of Act 148, um, we as CSG Justice Center were able to continue to provide technical assistance to Vermont, um, this time focused on implementing rather than developing policy changes. And so we were really able to see firsthand the efforts of the stakeholders, staff, and leadership to make all of this happen. Um, so really just quickly focusing on policy changes one through three, the DOC and the parole board did make extensive policy procedure and then ultimately practice changes that they're still implementing now. They also developed and intended months of trainings um, to expand and refine their use of evidence-based practices. 
Um, and then they took significant steps to improve data collection and reporting capacity, really all to support the goals of Act 148. And again, re you know, reducing recidivism, reducing those returns to incarceration and reducing that reliance on the furlough system. Um, and then we talked just briefly, but you know, obviously wanting to really call out the efforts of the um, Racial Disparities Advisory Panel and the reports that they produced for you all as a result of, um, of Act 148 to continue to really dive a little bit deeper into racial disparity um, data. And so, well, I'm, so I'm gonna you know, transition to a couple of data slides as I mentioned, um, but just wanna reiterate again that it was a huge lift for folks to make these system changes happen. So if you go to the next slide, um, as part of our technical assistance, we worked with um, the Department of Corrections and the Parole Board to develop um, what we call data monitoring measures that help track the implementation of key policy reforms. Um, so the next couple of slides are really just kind of walking through some um, highlights from that data. So first, what you see here is an updated version of the sentence incarcerated population projection chart that I showed earlier. So that light blue dotted line is the projected sentenced incarcerated population from our team's analysis back in 2019. And then the orange shaded area that you see below that is the projected population taking into account the potential impact of Vermont's justice reinvestment reforms um, also done in 2019. And so again, neither of these projections reflect the impacts of COVID-19 obviously. And so then that dark blue line is the actual sentenced incarcerated population as of January 2022, which is actually 34 people less than a year ago in January 2021. So as you can see here, Vermont's current sentenced incarcerated population is really well below projections, which is unsurprising, right? Um, you know, this is primarily what we're, you're seeing here is the impacts of COVID-19 and what were significantly reduced prison admissions over the past two years. Um, so since the start of the pandemic, the sentenced incarcerated population has declined about 30% in Vermont. So then the question is, given COVID, what, what can this tell us, right? What can this tell us about justice reinvestment too? Um, so it's, it's really important to note and be very clear that it will be con uh, continue to be really difficult to monitor the impact of justice reinvestment to policies or population trends for the reason that you see here. Um, however, DOC has started to report emissions data and will have additional data available through data system upgrades that are in progress that will allow Vermont to focus in and monitor the implementation of specific reforms in order to see whether or not they are achieving intended goals, kind of regardless of disruptions that you see in these trend lines. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, one way that you can do this is to revisit what we talked about earlier, which are the proportion of prison emissions that are returns and particularly furlough returns to incarceration. Um, so as you recall, prior to Justice Reinvestment II, over 50% of admissions were returns from furlough. Um, although the data that you see here is limited and obviously COVID impacted, um, it is promising that from July 2021 to January 2022, only about 7% of admissions to prison were returns from furlough. Um, the vast majority of returns that you see here are um, returns from supervision, which could partly be a shift in proportion, given two things. So not necessarily a red flag, but um, thinking about, you know, one, there's been a reduction in um, other admission categories, including furlough, and then two, there's been an overall kind of reduction in admissions. Um, there is also likely, when we've had conversations with folks in the state about this, that um, that this could be reflect disruptions in court processes as things slow down and then come back online again, really due, you know, due to COVID. So, you know, overall, um, it is still early to really come to any conclusions or identify any meaningful trends, um, but the reduction in furlough returns is promising. Um, and it will definitely be something for you all to continue to watch over time, as well as monitoring those probation returns. Um, but it is exciting and a good step forward that you have this information available, available to you for decision-making purposes. And so the next slide, the line graph shows, is similar to what we talked about with the sentenced and incarcerated population, but this is for the community supervision population. Oh, I think I see a hand representative. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Dave. Yes. Would, oh, would yes. you like me, yes, would you like please. me to? Hold my question, Madam oh, Chair. Oh, that's okay. Please go ahead, Dave. Um, thank you. I'll try to be brief. The um, 
the majority of the people returning to readmission are on furlough. And the decision to readmit someone is entirely up to the Department of Corrections when on furlough. Is that correct? Prior, prior to justice reinvestment, um, the majority, the fifty percent of folks returning were on furlough. That number has gone actually gone down, and the data that we have here from July twenty twenty one to January twenty twenty two, that number is now seven percent. Um, again, there's uh, been I'm changes in kind of proportion and amount um, that make this okay. like not necessarily an apples to apples comparison, um, but it is a you know, um, and, and again, a lot of that is just due to COVID. Um, I'm I'm sorry. But, yep. Uh, uh, just to clarify. I'm maybe having trouble with my colors. I thought the 61% were for, for low. Not so? Those are probation. Probation. Those are the, and those mm -hmm. require the courts. Um, now, is it the same? Is it the same staff that oversee people on furlough that are overseeing people on probation? Or is it a different um, supervisory structure? I'll actually turn that over to Monica. I see her turning her camera on. <laughs> I am paying attention. Correct. So in all of these statuses, because as you know, Vermont is a unified system. If someone's on furlough, they're on probation, they're on parole, they are in the community and they're supervised by staff um, in our probation and parole offices around the state. Okay. I, I remember when uh, for the former commissioner, um, uh, Baker, was testifying. I asked him, if there was a cultural um, buy-in or um, uh, of the staff that might be influencing the readmissions, either I'm going to violate you on a te technical um, uh, violation because I'm worried you're going to do something really bad, and I don't, I, I want to bring you back in, or, or there just were a lot of different attitudes on restorative justice. To your knowledge, does any of that enter into this, or is it a pretty much a structured decision-making process when someone comes back in? It's it's kind of a complex answer, to, to be honest with you. And I will tell you that as part of justice reinvestment, as Madeline mentioned, the department made really extensive changes to the way in which we look at um, violations of supervision, not just violations for furlough, but probation and parole, and really thinking about them as um, similar legal statuses and supervising people across those legal statuses uh, by their risk level. And one of the things that we did was really reinforce um, the um, ability to uh, work with people on graduated types of sanctions that do not um, result in a return to incarceration. Um, and there is another small part of um, Act 148 that carved out uh, a technical violation and why the department could in fact return someone to incarceration for a technical violation. So we took all of that, we really restructured um, that whole process. And that's very much also contributed to the reduction in the returns. So right now we're seeing returns um, for really significant violations, new crimes, um, new crimes and people absconding. Um, and as part of that, we, as Madeline mentioned, also through um, implementation funds that we received through um, a sub award, we're able to hold a lot of like trainings and sessions with our staff to reinforce Great. a lot of the um, concepts of justice reinvestment. So I, I feel like we're definitely moving in, in the right direction there. There's always room for um, improvement. Um, but I hope I hope that um, answers your Thank question. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you, welcome. Madam Chair. Yep. Thank you. And we have a couple more questions here in the room. Um, Kimberly? Uh, I think this is probably a DOC question. Um, Paul, there was discussion about electronic monitoring in the state of Vermont and all the pros and cons given um, cell phone coverage, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just curious where that stands. Well, we do use electronic monitoring um, and there's a whole, there's a whole, none of that changed um, related to justice reinvestment. I would say the only thing that changed is part of the 
Act 148 changes were to um, eliminate a particular legal status called home confinement, which also would have um, required electronic monitoring. But electronic monitoring is a supervision tool um, and it's for people who go through an assessment process and the department determines um, their risk and determines if electronic monitoring is appropriate for them. Thank you. And Ada, thank you. Mine's a, a quite superficial question. It could be the light in the room. For the life of me, I'm having trouble uh, with the colors. The little uh, schematic down below. The furlough returns. Is that the seven percent? That's correct. Seven percent. Thank you. And, and then the new sentences. That's the nine percent. Correct. I think I got it. And then the ten percent. What's the ten percent? Ten percent. Work crew returns. Okay. Work group, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. What you can't see is that it's a very gray day here. And while we love our new committee room, the light is terrible. So we, we do struggle to see sometimes. So I think we're ready to continue. Sure, no problem. David, I, I did see that you had your um, you were unmuted for a minute. Did you want to add anything before I keep going? I, uh, I was just going to actually reinforce what Monica was saying in terms of the culture change uh, and the thinking in DOC that they've been doing. Historically, um, Representative uh, Yakovon, if I've pronounced your name right, uh, Morris, Morriston. Uh, historically, there are pr probation and parole agents and community corrections agents, and there were cultural differences between those two groups, but uh, both under the pre previous commissioner and with all of the folks in DOC now, they've been really working very hard to do those things that Monica's talking about and to really make that culture shift so that there's a greater coherence and cohesion across the department, and, and they've been doing that really consistently and, and working very hard at it for the last couple of years. So I just wanted to kind of reinforce those changes because I, I recall a previous conversation where I think you were asking about that and, and concern over the differences between those two areas. And, and I just want to reinforce that I think those things are really clearly being worked on and, and being moved in the right direction in, in a very big way. Quick, quick follow-up, if I may, Madam Chair, to that. Um, first, you did a great job at Giacovoni very close. And um, uh, does DOC have the capacity, if I were, if we all work for them, are they able to say, Dave, you know, um, over the course of a 12 month period, you return 42% of your caseload and the department average is 19%. Um, but the acuity of your caseload was much higher than the rest. So adjusted, you're okay. Would that kind of metric monitoring um, uh, be counterproductive to what you want to do, or do you just want to really uh, instill the, the values? Is there that kind of monitoring that goes on? I'm not advocating it. I'm just asking. Are you asking me, Representative? Whoever might know. <laughs> Whoever might know. Well, let, well let, me, let me just start by saying um, the department does not do that type of monitoring. Um, you know, so we are improving, and this is part of the justice reinvestment um, data improvement that Madeline mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we we will admit that we were really had a hard time looking at returns and understanding the reasons for returns, and so we have um, and are still in the process of making improvements to our database in order to be really clear and to be able to produce more reports in a much more timely manner. We, we've come a long way with the support of CSG and thinking through the data monitoring so we can answer questions more readily now. That type of report, quite honestly, we haven't um, considered. And you know, I would wanna think about that for a variety of reasons, um, understanding that the complexity of the caseloads is, is um, 
mm-hmm. not always the same, right? But I do think that there is, um, you know, benefit in, in those types of reviews, right? How looking at those things and then understanding, okay, what what's happening from a from from a learning perspective. Um, but we're not doing that right now, and I think it could take us a, a little bit longer to be able to to get there. I, I, would, add to, I would just add to that, Representative, that um, in some other states that we're working in, Pennsylvania, Missouri, et cetera, we've been working on a process called Lantern, which does allow for us to be able to look at and for the state to be able to look at by officer, by risk level, by caseload uh, 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 composition by frequency, all of those things. Uh, and it does allow one to zone in on where there may be need for additional supports and education, et cetera. But I would also want to be very clear that if Vermont were to do that, DOC would need significant additional resources. They can't simply make that happen with what they have now. That would, would be an unfair ask of them. Uh, so I just sort of want to make that point in these other states that we've been working with, there, there are very significant amount of resources that were put toward the development of that. Isn't that more an IT tracking though, a data management? It is IT, but the development of that and the um, ability to not only put in the data in, a, in the right way but, and to get it out mm-hmm. uh, is quite significant. And so to, to simply say to DOC or to any organization, hey, we want this info without that infrastructure being built is it would be un, unreasonable. And, and Und, so I, under, I just want I, to speak up with them about that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. And that makes sense. Uh, as you said that, it, what it triggered for me is that the capacity to know whether, you know, we're, we're, we have far more re, re-offenses, I'm ad-libbing to make a point, in the Northeast Kingdom because there's no transportation services. We're so rural, et cetera. Uh, we can't get people jobs and, it, and, and then it just spirals out of control versus um, uh, a, a host of different factors. And uh, aside from the capacity to hold people accountable and to measure their excess as, uh, success as is done in many other industries, it, it, would, seem, it, w- it would seem like a discussion. Uh, I guess you say other states are doing it. I don't know the return on investment. Now, does it, does it uh, would the investments necessary um, uh, yield the value that you want. Uh, thanks. Thanks. I just, I'm mulling it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Monica? Well, I just wanted to actually uh, also follow up with um, what David mentioned around the resources and to give you an example. So with the um, sub award that we did receive for implementation of justice reinvestment, the department um, put about $120,000 into um, uh, our database updates so so that we could do better reporting and tracking on a lot of different things. I can tell you that um, the amount of time and energy that it's taking, we have a tiny, tiny unit within our department that's responsible for managing our database. It is all consuming and we still have to manage all the other, you know, it's the database that runs the department. We still have to keep it going in addition to doing all of these um, enhancements and implementation. And so um, just to put that point on it, it's, it, it'll it probably be the entire, um, well, how long will it be, Madeline, when we finish? Year plus um, for us to, to make the changes that we need to do with that amount. So it's, um, when people say IT changes, I just want to reinforce that it's not, it takes so much more than what people may believe to do those types of things. Well, so we have another question here, but I can't help but jump in. Um, a, a number of years ago, it would have been kind to say that we had an antiquated data management system. I mean, there were were times when you were literally doing hand counts of prisoners because you could not, your data system could not do that. Um, So we may have made incremental improvements to it, but honestly, in, in my opinion, as someone who's on the committee responsible for providing you with the resources, we've done it on the cheap 
and uh, really haven't acknowledged what the significant data needs are within your organization. Um, and I, I think that is something that is, is worth having an ongoing conversation about. Um, nice. I, it, yeah. And well, we'd be so, happy to do that. And again, it's it's about the system and it's about the people that support people. the system. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. it's not a matter of just buying some spiffy new system. You've got to, one, you need to know what you're asking and, and what you want. But two, you also have to have the ability to get, you know, put the data in and then manage it. It's, it's I think we get the complexity here. Um, Kimberly? Yeah, actually that, that aligns with what I'm muddling right now, which is, I know we hear a lot about DOC and the correctional facilities themselves about very high vacancy rates. And I'm wondering if, it, if there's a snapshot in time sort of average of what the average caseload is for folks who are trying to manage uh, people on the various status, um, classifications and what the vacancy rate might be. And that was partly behind my electronic uh, monitoring question because in the day, it was sort of seen as a way to extend the reach of DOC without having to do new hires, et cetera, et cetera. And no doubt it had many more implications as well. And I realize that and not trying to revisit that. But, but to your point about the human beings who try to make everything work. Um, can you comment on that? Uh, are you asking around the current staffing patterns and what the shortages might be there? Uh, Is that? Yeah, I, for example, when we talk about, I don't know, I have the statistic in my mind, and the DOC has an average 40% vacancy in terms of correctional officers of you know an entry level or I don't know and I'm just sort of wondering in terms of DOC personnel who monitor folks who are on parole or, or, or furlough what is their caseload and what is the vacancy for sure. that DOC so I, I, I'll tell you that I'm, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question I don't have that information right now and so maybe that's something that that we could follow up with you about. Um, the one thing that I'll just point you to, of course, um, is that our supervised population in the community has has declined uh, sig significantly. <clears throat> um, and I don't know, since the deputy commissioner is on, if he wants to add here around the vacancies, the vacancies that we're experiencing are primarily within correctional facilities. I don't know, Matt, if you have anything you want to add on this topic. <clears throat> Matt. Apologies, all. Matt Agostino, interim deputy commissioner, was having trouble unmuting and uh, getting on video quickly. Um, yeah, I think it is information we may need to get back to on in terms of in terms of the vacancies. I don't have the information right in front of me, but kind of ballpark the. The vacancy rate overall is is somewhere in the 17, 18 percent area in terms of total vacancies across the department. That's inclusive of field, facility, central office, all of our positions that are vacant right now. Um, and as Monica mentioned, the majority of the positions that are vacant are within correctional facilities. Uh, there are certainly some probation and parole vacancies, uh, but it's it's much lower in in terms of the percentage. Thank you. Certainly. And. Dave, is that a legacy hand on your screen? I think it must be. So let, let's return to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair, I do just want to check with you. I know we had 45 minutes today, and we're getting very close to that 45 minutes. I can keep going. I'm happy to jump to the um, reinvestment recommendations, the funding recommendations, and the working group, whatever's most useful for you all today. We have flexibility in our time if you do in yours. We do, thank you. So if um, we can pick back up on slide 11 and actually um, Monica was just talking about the reduction in the community supervision population. And so that's what you see here. Um, obviously since COVID-19, there's been a drastic drop in the community supervision population. 
That dotted line, that dotted blue line, again, is the projected status quo that doesn't reflect impacts from Justice Reinvestment 2 or COVID-19. And then that dark solid line is the actual population, which in January 2022 was 4,388 people, and that is 935 people actually less than even March 2021. So if you go to the next slide, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. And what you see here is that there's actually been a drop in population across all community supervision caseload types. But what I want to draw your attention to is as furlough in orange, where you see that red arrow on the right side of your slide. Um, and what you see there is that there's um, been a specifically a 35% decrease in people on furlough. So again, while this is very limited early data, it does show it could be signs of a reduction of reliance on furlough generally, which is again one of those goals of justice reinvestment too. So um, both DOC and the parole board are continuing to provide this and other data to us, um, which we're actually in the process now of working on um, generating into a regular report that goes back to the state, back to you all and the working group, and then obviously DOC and the parole board, so that you all can continue to monitor these implementation outcomes. Um, so we look forward to being able to provide that hopefully soon to you all. So if you go to slide 13, um, we, you know, we just spent some time talking primarily about the act, changes in Act 148. But as I mentioned earlier, Act 148 also you know, reconvened the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group, um, not just to oversee implementation, but also to make additional policy recommendations in several other areas. Um, so as a result, Vermont is actually um, what was unique, but it's kind of coming, becoming more standard in some of the states that we're working in. Um, but you all actually ended up engaging in three rounds of policy development, which is pretty significant. So in um, the very first column here in blue, that's obviously Act 148 that we talked about. Um, if you look in the green, the second green column, that's the second round of recommendations in 2021. Um, which resulted in legislation revising Vermont's existing probation midpoint review process to make it more presumptive, um, and then also um, establishing a pilot to provide judges with reports pre-sentencing to help inform their um, condition setting based on people's risks and needs, and specifically their um, mental health and substance use treatment needs to set them up for success on probation. Um, the Working Group's 2021 recommendations also included the establishment of an um, internal cross-department AHS Working Group to continue to explore service connection and coordination issues, um, recommendations around piloting the placement of licensed clinicians and local supervision offices, and then recommendations around using a validated mental health screen tool for people that are sentenced directly to misdemeanor probation. And then in 2022, in the orange here at the end, um, is the working group's third round of recommendations um, that focused on their study of a parole for older adults policy. Um, so, and then also the results of the racial equity and sentencing analysis that I mentioned earlier, as well as reinvestment funding. So I'm gonna dive into the reinvestment funding piece um, a little bit deeper, but um, I did wanna say again, if you're interested in any of these other recommendations, please don't hesitate to ask questions, but also there's a lot more detail in the Working Group's 2022 report that talks about um, where these were in implementation as of at least um, the end of last year. So if you go on to slide 14, um, so for the first year or two of Justice Reinvestment 2, um, Vermont identified both reinvestments, um, reinvestment funding from out-of-state bed savings as well as what we call upfront investments, which is new funding to support justice reinvestment efforts. Um, during 2021, Vermont made $900,000 investment in you know, that upfront funding um, in community-based supports and programming. And that included domestic violence intervention programming, transitional housing, and then also mental health and substance use services. And then on top of that, um, for fiscal year 2021 and 2022, um, Vermont identified a total of $770,000 um, from out-of-state contract bed savings available for reinvestment, again, in community-based services. And so the working group was tasked with making recommendations regarding potential reinvestments and decided to focus on kind of the four broad categories that you see on slide 14. Um, and this is where either, you know, for reinvestment funding or um, upfront investment funding, basically where um, investment could support the goals of justice reinvestment too. 
So I'm going to go through these categories and actually turn it over to David to add some additional context. So for the, the first um, bullet point is the working group recommended a kind of ongoing investment in domestic violence intervention programming through the Vermont Council on Domestic Violence. So again, this is that continuation of funding received through the fiscal year 2021 upfront investment I mentioned earlier. Um, they also recommended, and this goes back to our earlier conversation, but that ongoing investment in data collection and analysis, including any additional changes um, to DOC's offender management system. I would also add personnel here. Um, while they were able to use several grant dollars um, to do some of this work, I think you all articulated really well that data investment is not one and done. And, and so it's really going to be important to pay ongoing attention to be able to get the information that you need and want to make decisions, both at the department level and at the um, lawmaker, you know, policy level. Um, the working group also recommended ongoing investment, no surprise to anyone, probably in mental health and substance use disorder services and criminogenic interventions for people with complex needs. And David's going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to skip to the last one. Um, which is that we heard kind of over and over again from a lot of our working group members that housing remains a tremendous barrier to helping people um, succeed in the community. So this isn't just you all have done a wonderful job in investing in transitional housing, um, but really also you know, taking a step back and thinking holistically about ways to address housing challenges for this particular population. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, David, if you wanna jump in here. Sure, I, I'm gonna make some comments about um, mental health and SUD and, and uh, collaboration and also the domestic violence piece as well. Uh, as those of you that know me, I am often the nudge in the room. Uh, and so I'm going to be uh, talking about some of the good things that have happened, but also some of the challenges. And uh, I'm going to start with the issue of community-based mental health and substance use services. And in fact, uh, there are additional dollars that are being put into that. Uh, there has been some training of community mental health services. DOC has been working on that. But to be honest, I have been disappointed in the progress around coordination between the agencies and AHS. Um, you know, when I've talked to the legislature over the last seven years that I've been involved in Vermont, I've often hear, heard complaints about, you know, DOC going it alone. DOC has to go it alone because they often are put in the position of going it alone. Uh, there is, there remains a lack of coordination. There remains a lack of understanding that the clients that DOC has are the same clients that need services in all of the other agencies. And so I would hope that as things move forward, that the legislature will continue to put a focus on improving the coordination and collaboration among the multiple agencies within AHS and providing those supports as needed for DOC. It's never good for any agency to have to go it alone, any agency at all. Uh, it, it forces people to look inward. It forces people to create alternatives to what is the best thing to do because it's all they can do. And so it's unfair, quite frankly, to argue that DOC is going it alone and then not have not have DOC be able to have the kinds of supports that it needs. And so uh, while there has been progress, and I don't want to suggest that there hasn't been, there needs to be more. And uh, it is, I think, in the state's best interest to recognize that DOC clients are not people that are over there by themselves but are part of the larger state and need those services and supports that other agencies provide in conjunction with DOC. So that's my one big nudge. My second one has to do with domestic violence. Um, the good news is that the state has put some money into domestic violence. Domestic violence programs, uh, they put $300,000 into that, which means that the community programs, one, don't have to rely on fees for survival and can actually are actually beginning to use a risk needs responsivity model, which means, in other words, improvement of their services because they were a one size fits all service. It's imperative that that funding continue. Uh, it's imperative that uh, that they continue to get that and that those services become the specialized services they need to be as opposed to folks just getting general uh, criminogenic services. The 
nice thing about that is that they really forgive my dog in the background if you can hear that barking uh, the nice thing about that is that they, they really have taken it on as uh, a challenge to improve those services and those services need to be improved there's no question about that and and one of the things that's happened for vermont is that you've received an additional award to look at domestic violence services and then look at the responses to domestic violence. And that's with your Department of Public Safety. We at CSG and myself are working with that group as well in terms of that. But one of the flip concerning things that I've learned is that there's a major budget fall for victim services. I don't know why, but the dollars have not been appropriated for victim services. That's very concerning to me because while it is important that we have the dollars for those people who are committing the behavior to change their behavior, given Vermont's genuine concern about those people who have been victimized in public safety, people really need to take a look at what's happening here and make sure that victim services are receiving the necessary supports. It, it's sort of counterintuitive to Vermont's concerns about public safety. It's certainly counterintuitive to the work that we're doing with the Domestic Violence Committee and Public Safety. And, and for those of you that don't know, what we're looking at in that project is every intercept. We're looking at community services, we're looking at law enforcement, we're looking at the courts, we're looking at corrections, we're looking at community supervision. And I can tell you that as no doubt, no surprise to any of you, we're finding that there can be improvements made in every one of those intercepts and ultimately probably suggest some tweaks even to your laws regarding domestic violence. So um, one, I want to applaud folks in terms of the work that's been done in terms of the additional funding for domestic violence perpetrator services. Um, I want to really support that the Department of Correction has been doing a tremendous number of things to improve what they're doing in terms of their supervision of folks, in terms of working with folks with mental illness, in terms of community wraparound services. And then I want to have two cautionary statements. One, you need to, that there needs to be further improvement of collaboration and coordination among all the other agencies that people in DOC need support from. And two, the uh, strongly urge the legislature to figure out what is going on with funding around victim services and to make sure that victim services get what they need so that we don't make the mistake of improving one half of the of the one side of the uh, piece, which is those people who are committing the behavior and leave those people that have been hurt in the dust. I'm sure there was no intent about that, but it, it appears that at least inadvertently that's what's occurring. So would encourage folks to look at that. And uh, with that, my, my nudge roll ends and I will stop talking. Well, I wanna jump in and I really appreciate you being the nudge. We need to hear that sort of information. Let me note that with regard to victim services, we have kind of this structural problem. Victim services is a private nonprofit organization that is grant-based. And as you know, the, the, um, the federal money is declining. And so there is an interesting issue that I think we need to have a serious conversation in this committee about of, you know, do we backfill declining uh, revenue sources to a nonprofit? But the more fundamental question that I think you're asking, or my interpretation is, should they be a nonprofit? Should they be part of the state structure to which we then have an obligation to appropriately fund? Um, and, and I'm maybe way too far in the weeds, but that's the conversation we can have in this room because I hear you saying very clearly that we need to have sufficient services to address the needs if we're serious about resolving the larger problem. And so we need to be thinking about the structural issues and not maybe not getting hung up on the nonprofit status. But I do have to say in our defense, um, I'm not sure that we see it as our obligation to backfill revenue deficits in nonprofits but that's separate from the need to provide services. Got it. Yeah, um, absolutely, uh, Chairman. The, uh, 
the structure is way outside my purview. Uh, my, my concern is simply making sure that victims' needs are met. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. It, and thank you for noting the the duality of of that need. That it's not about just providing um, violence prevention services, but we also need to be looking at the victims' needs. Also, um, I recall from maybe golly, sometimes I lose track. Time has no meaning in the COVID world, but sometime in the past, I recall you being terribly concerned about the level of um, funding for um, substance use and mental health. It, it was noted that we did a little bit, uh, 300,000, I think. My recollection is that that is, your, your view was that that was just a drop in the bucket of the needs. Can you kind of correct me or get me to the right need? Uh, th that certainly is. Uh, we, uh, we certainly don't have uh, a number to, to give you. What we know is that the three hundred thousand was a was a really great upfront uh, investment to to make improvements to begin to think about how to have additional funding for services to begin to think about are there different funding patterns that can be thought about in terms of making sure that services are prioritizing. Uh, those clients who are in the criminal justice system, and I don't mean prioritizing in the sense of ignoring others, but but really sort of having a component of their programming that is designed to work with those folks. Uh, would that does that three hundred thousand dollars meet your need? Uh, it certainly does not when we when we look at the shortfalls. But there's a second component to that. To be fair, there's the issue of the money. There's the issue, there's three components. Issue of the money, and do you need more money put into substance use and mental health? And the answer to that would be yes. And no, I don't know what that upper number should be. That, that's a whole other study, frankly. The second issue is even if you have the money, do you have the people to be able to provide the services in terms of workforce shortages? And then the third issue is the one that we, we did try to get to, uh, and the DOCs tried to get to with uh, doing a training of community providers. There needs to be much more of that. Uh, there, there were not as many community providers involved as I would have hoped. That that's uh, you know that was an invite only. That's nobody's fault. It's just who came, who was willing to come um, to those sorts of things. And so I think there's three things. Uh, one is there needs to be an increase in the funding and no, I don't have an answer. And, and uh, yes, we probably could with some discussion come up with uh, a ballpark number that would be helpful. Two, there's the issue of thinking about resources. And so the things that need to be thought about there is one, can there be an improvement in telehealth? Because as uh, the representative was talking about, when you have great distances in terms of transportation, you're going to have some limits in terms of how people can get to services, et cetera. And so uh, is there some ability to increase telehealth? And then the third one is, are there things in your statutes uh, and certifications that make it difficult for people in the adjoining states to come over and to provide services? In other words, are, are you inadvertently making things difficult in terms of licensing and certifications uh, so that folks from, you know, wherever or right around you, if you will, uh, could cannot provide services? In some of the states in the Midwest that we've been working with in the West, where they have gigantic, gigantic hundreds of miles distances, uh, their their improvement in telehealth has been dramatic. I'm thinking particularly in Minnesota is one place. And one of the things that they've done is they've looked at their statutes so that folks that are providing telehealth, clinicians, psychiatrists, et cetera, from the adjoining states, not even within the state, but from the adjoining states can provide that. Um, and so they looked at their licensing and certification to make sure, <clears throat> excuse me, they weren't keeping uh, uh, basically resources that were available from being able to help them, particularly in some of the frontier uh, parts of the state that they're, that they're dealing with. So um, I don't know if that helps, but th those are my, my thoughts in terms of your question. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple more questions in the room, but I have to note that one of the good things that's come out of the pandemic for us is that we have we are 
have changed our telehealth statutes. And so I'm inclined to believe that the, the access to mental health services via tele, telehealth ha, will improve as those, we, we just changed that. So hopefully we'll see some change there. Uh, Rep Jessup and then Rep Taylor. I think I'm about to uh, assume the mantle of the nudge in the room, but um, I'm making an assumption, fairly or unfairly, that because we've seen these numbers drop, that the acuity of the remaining caseload is higher. That's one assumption, and anyone is free to comment on it or not. And then where I'm going from that is I'm looking at slide 14 and looking at housing related needs. And uh, we had testimony earlier this week from DCF that um, many people who are currently housed in the hotel program through federal funds may find themselves um, unhoused sooner than we had anticipated because of changing federal guidance. And I, I know that there was a rental risk, that, well, there was a risk pool in the budget adjustment that DCF had done. And I know, um, Deputy Commissioner D'Agostino, that you and I had had some exchange about the possibility of DCF and DOC coordinating potentially around populations that um, may be uh, crossing into the realm of both departments. And I just, throw out those thoughts and welcome any feedback that others care to share. <laughs> or I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone jump here. Yeah. I, I can speak to the acuity issue only. Um, you, Vermont already had the most complex group of folks uh, that, that I have seen in years. And so it is a very logical statement to say that those people that are, are left are among the, have the most acute and problematic issues, whether those are criminogenic factors or mental health and substance use uh, factors in some combination with criminogenic factors. Uh, in, in other words, the fact that there's less people doesn't mean their job got easier. Um, they probably, what they probably have, based on what we saw that they had to begin with, what they probably have are the folks who have, who were the highest of the already really high group of people that they were dealing with in corrections. Thank you. Um, so we have a number of questions and I, I now feeling like we're trespassing on your time. So let's do the questions and we'll let, let you take us to the end. Rick Taylor. <laughs> yes, when, when we started this portion of our, our Justice Reinvestment two several years ago, the idea of well, the whole idea of Justice Reinvestment is that money saved by using the community services is recycled back in and um, reinvested. And at the time, there was a projection that I believe it was 20 million would be saved over 10 years. So we should be investing at least 2 million a year to uh, justice, additional justice reinvestment uh, services. The problem is, I think what we found is that the only clear measure that we've come up with for measuring the effect of our justice reinvestment to initiative is in the reduction in bed savings. There we have um, an out-of-state bed savings. So there we have a clear number that we say we've saved 400,000 this year, so that 400,000 that we're saved gets reinvested. The trouble is that there are a number of other places that I'm sure we're saving money, or we should be saving money, that we aren't tracking or are unable to track. I'm trying to, I would like that. Are states doing things that make it easier to track the actual savings from justice reinvestment that we can point to as a justification for uh, increased investment in the community, if you see what I mean? Absolutely, Representative. This is this is something that we, we see states struggle with. And actually, there's things Vermont has done that we think are, are kind of models on how to approach reinvestment funding, in particular, the fact that you all have you know, designated, you know, where it's coming from, you know, how you're measuring it, and then walling off that funding and statute. Um, I, you know, that you're, you're absolutely right, kind of the, there can be, 
and it can be kind of amorphous to try to figure out, you know, where you're seeing all of the benefits of the work that you're doing um, across the system. I think, you know, um, out-of-state contract bed savings is one area that's pretty concrete for you all. Um, other states have looked at, um, have also experienced similar challenges, especially because if they're aiming to avert prison growth, um, then they're not necessarily closing a facility or closing a wing or doing something that's going to be a big kind of big chunk um, there. And so there's been kind of different ways folks have have tackled with this question. I do think the fact that you all have started out with something that's 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 fairly concrete and gotten you to at least be able to identify very early, even though there's there's obviously COVID conversations in there, and COVID impacts, but early reinvestment savings is a good sign for you all. Um, and that you uh, continue to kind of wall off that funding to invest in community-based services. And then it doesn't just kind of get wrapped back up in everything else. Um, so yes, absolutely a challenging question that other states have have wrestled with as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Shai. Uh, thank you. And thank you all for coming and giving us this presentation. I actually took a look at the full report that was uh, sent to us as well. And I sort of following up on the housing and the funding and all of those things, the one one place where the group was not able to come to recommendation was about a parole policy for older adults in Vermont. And um, I'm sort of wondering, because that seems to me there's a there's housing issues related to that. There's also could be funding. And if we're saving money somewhere, can we put more money into uh, funding in the communities for housing and things that, where, where is that going to go? What's, what's, what's going to be happening with that area? Sure. So that you're, you're right. The, um, the working group did kind of an extensive study of a parole for older adults policy. And one of the main issues that they found is that, you know, even if Vermont were to put that policy in place, where do people go? Right. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to make sure that there's a level of service available in the community. And um, there are a couple of models that other states have used that I know Vermont has looked at. Um, but at the end, the working group decided, you know, not to kind of move forward with a yes or a no, but to also but to kind of more take a take a step, recognize some of the challenges with just implementing a parole for older adults policy and then getting the outcomes that you would actually want from that. And look at them, look at it a little bit more, recommend the legislature look at it a little more holistically, which includes really having a conversation about, you know, not just the, the, the words in the statute and having the policy on the books, but really thinking about, you know, how would we get, how would we be able to create these places in the community for these, for these folks that have really high needs, um, for them to have those needs met. Right, um, and so, the, and and given the kind of the struggle with nursing homes generally not wanting to, you know, uh, obviously accept this population and some of the risks that goes with it, that that's kind of where the conversation needs to focus before um, you're thinking about, or in addition to, depending on, you know, I think working group members kind of had different, I don't want to speak for all of them, but had different thoughts on that, um, you know, putting that statute on the books. And I definitely mm -hmm. welcome. I know Monica was there for all of those conversations. If you. Uh, if you want to add or edit that characterization of the working groups discussion. Well, yeah. It's, <laughs> well, I think you sums it up nicely, Madeline. The other thing I just want to um, remind people is that Vermont already does have a statute around medical parole. And that was one of the other issues as well. So there are There is a mechanism right now um, <laughs> for people to be released on parole for medical reason. And I think, you know, there was conversation around expanding that, changing that. And there are a lot of these complex issues around um, releasing someone who has a serious medical illness with no place um, for them to be cared for. So I think we just sort of left it in the in the legislature's hands to do Mm. Move forward. Yeah, I, know, I feel like we had this conversation in a circular fashion for a number of years, um, and and I I think I'm right that the population of our incarcerated folks is also increasing, and they are getting more complex. So we we're going to just that trajectory is not going in the right direction. So we're going to have to deal with it. Thanks. And I think it is in our lap. Um, so Representative Yacovani. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be quick. I appreciate the time. Um, I, I worked many years ago with then Commissioner John Gorchek uh, on uh, these issues uh, back in the uh, early to mid 90s. And it's uh, it's fascinating. And there's so many different aspects to it. But what I wanted to key on was David's comment that um, 
the cooperation we need with other community-based uh, uh, players and providers uh, seems essential. We could have a coalition of the willing or a lot of forced marriages. And obviously the coalition of the willing makes more sense. But in Vermont, we have, as you may know, something called a designated agency system with our mental health agencies. And I've long wondered why we didn't embed and infuse those staff from our designated agencies in our, in our facilities with the thought that there might be a better chance of continuity of care. I'm not a clinician, but I've learned the continuity of care and most of us would know is a good thing. And with the hope that when a person is discharged, maybe they've built up enough, enough trust with the staff that when they begin working with the entire family, hopefully before they're even discharged, there's a greater chance of success to deal with the shame, to deal with the anxiety, to deal with all the tensions around possibly severed relationships, et cetera. Um, do, you, do you think, um, I think I probably know the answer to this, but should Vermont say by statute, our designated agencies shall be the uh, preferred provider for our, our uh, prison system? Uh, so what I would say is that that statement would be outside of our purview in terms of what we've been asked to look at. What I will say is that generally across the country, reentry services are not very good, to be very blunt. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons that they're not very good is the disconnect between the inside and the outside. And there should be less of a disconnect between inside and outside. And whether it is through what you're saying or it is through other processes that make sure that people begin working with folks prior to them returning to the community, that there's a number of ways to go about that. So, so I think what I can say that falls within our purview is that people shouldn't start seeing people after they get out. There should be an in-reach process of some sort. What that looks like, how you do that, that's for Vermont to determine or to ask others to work on to figure out the best way to go about it. We had a presentation last week on uh, performance management throughout state government, pretty much buried within the report was some, to me, powerful corrections data. It made me think that we were operating hospitals. Uh, over half the people had chronic uh, conditions, half were being treated for mental health, over half were receiving a MAT a therapy for drug issues, and it just seems so profound to me that um, that's I th those are it's a separate healthcare system, and and we've got to do something to connect that on on the outside. So, it's it's as you say, it's nothing is easy, is it? It's all heavy lift. So it it seems that we have come for full circle in this conversation. Uh, early on, we began with the uh, acknowledgement or the note that um, DOC should not exist um, as a silo, but in fact, the other services within the Agency of Human Services, and now we can extend it also to the community and the nonprofit sector, all need to be much better integrated. I mean, AHS is responsible for supervision and provision of healthcare services, both through the designated agency as well as, you know, its funding of, 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 of health access. Um, so that's, that's our big challenge is to figure out how to better marry or web these, these programs to serve Vermonters. Um, we we've been stalking you. I, I think we have one more slide that will take us to the end. Um, so let's return to that. That's it. Just one more. And and these are actually our recommendations, the CSG Justice Center's recommendations to the working group around the sustainability of justice reinvestment too. Um, and we've talked actually already about a lot of these different areas, so data, reinvestment, and oversight, um, obviously continuing to find ways to increase data collection analysis. We, um, we particularly point to the app, um, under, better understanding the use of incentives and sanctions through data, which I know the Department of Corrections is working on, um, as well as the collection of race and ethnicity data, which you all as a body have been talking a lot about this session. 
Um, we talked about reinvestment already and the fact that, you know, we really encourage you all to continue to direct out-of-state bed savings to um, community-based services. Um, we did talk briefly with the, with the working group. It's our understanding that reinvestment funds have to be spent within a year and that sometimes this can make it challenging to effectively and sustainably invest those dollars. Um, and so it can result in that funding being swept back into the general fund as I believe happened with that first fiscal year reinvestment funding. Um, and so we did recommend that this time period be extend, extended to two years um, so that that money again can be, can be sustainably and really meaningfully invested and not, and not swept back. Um, and then lastly, you know, we always recommend that states continue their justice reinvestment working groups. We know for you know, lots of reasons, including staffing, this is a challenge in Vermont. Um, but they really are places where stakeholders from across systems can come to, together to address these complex problems that really impact everyone. And we talked a lot today, I think, about kind of how um, it can't just be one system. We can't just have these conversations in one area, that it's got to be folks coming together um, if you're going to make headway. And so um, we do, we have seen other states continue to convene these bodies and continue to have that really you know, meaningful cross-system engagement and change happen. And so we, we do recommend um, that, that, that that be something that continues in Vermont. And so with that, that, that's the end of our presentation. Terrific, thank you. And I'm looking at my colleagues, I'm not seeing any additional questions. We really appreciate you taking the time with us. Well, one, the work that you've been doing with us over these years. And thank you for taking the time with us today to understand in a little more detail what what this work has been and and also our friends at doc it's great to see you and thank you for joining us here we appreciate it very much thank you madam chair we appreciate the opportunity to talk with you yeah terrific. Okay. all right we'll see you and committee um we are back here at one o'clock to continue the waiting study conversation